Hey guys, it's your girl Aisha aka Geek XX Chic and I'm back with another review to The Flash. It is back, it has been a minute, but we are back. And we are on episode 17, which was called Null and Annoyed. Um, if I was to give it an overall grade, I think I'd give this one maybe a B. Uh, it definitely wasn't my favorite of the season. Um, and particularly, I just feel like now that we had episode 15 enter Flash time, it was just so good. It was so good and so well done and just everything about it was like, I just, it was just one of my favorite, it was like, I think one of my favorite episodes of The Flash period. And when you set the standard there, I kind of like really keep measuring now all these episodes against that. And it's, I don't know, maybe I'm being harder on this episode than I probably would have been before I saw that episode, but yeah, I feel like it wasn't all bad. Uh, I'm going to go through all my discussion points, but I'd say the, the parts that were kind of hit or miss for me was definitely stuff to do with Team Flash and the Villain of the Week. But the stuff that really, really was done well was the stuff with the Thinker, with Marlise and, uh, and Clifford. So good. So good. But we'll come back around to them because that's some very interesting stuff. Let me just start on these points that I kind of thought were interesting in the episode. Null was a cool character as far as our villain of the week. Her powers were really neat. Uh, the actress who played her, she kind of, she didn't get a whole lot to say in this episode, but I really liked the attitude she came in with and, you know, she had a lot of sass and a lot of like swag and I'm like, okay girl, I see you. I think you're kind of cool. Um, and you know, despite that horrific wig they had her in, um, <laughs> It was a bad wig. It was a bad wig. But uh, we've already seen it on The Flash. For some reason, they just don't know how to find good wigs. And I mean, it, anyway. Uh, she was really cool from that aspect. And like the power to be able to basically change the density and levitate anything you touch is pretty amazing. Uh, and it's definitely could be very helpful. Now, what the thinker would need with that, I'm not sure. But I can't think that it would hurt. Sad that it sounds like she was already uh, someone who was criminally... Um, inclined before this happened so it wasn't one of those things where she developed powers and started doing bad things it looks like she's well i mean they said she didn't even appear uh, in anyone's system till she was 13 so that just kind of says to me that potentially she had a rough beginning and it just kind of kept going that way but kind of sad that we don't get another meta we can work with or deal with this week um unlike last week with melting point but anyways Nal was cool um she's in the pipeline for now and we'll have to see I think it's kind of cool though that it seems like DeVoe does not know that Team Flash has her, which is kind of interesting, but we'll come more to DeVoe in a minute. But yeah, that, for, as far as Null and, and what they did with her, I mean, I think, you know, her being a jewel thief, but just being so obvious about it, I feel like it was kind of, I don't know. I just kind of feel like the way they dealt with her didn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, she could levitate stuff. Yeah, I mean, I expected when they went, when like when Barry went um, to get her by himself when she'd robbed that bank, I the first thing I thought is she probably levitated something and has it as a safety net in case the cops come or something, right? But, um, it, I mean, she's not bulletproof. <laughs> you know what I mean? She's not, not, I mean, don't get me wrong. I know this is the Flash and they don't shoot people in the Flash. I'm just saying that, like, we know that they already have, like, the, the, the meta collar cuff, whatever you want to call it, shooter. We've seen Iris use it. We've seen Joe use it. So that could have been, you know, used, put around her neck. She would not be able to easily, you know, pick the, pick a lock that was around her neck. Um, they could have used uh, tr some kind of a tranquilizer. They could have used a taser. Like, there was just a lot of ways to take her out from a distance since all her powers were relied on her directly touching things. I understand if she could actually project it, that's different, but she's, you know, like her powers are very much like limited to as far as she can reach. And she didn't look that big to me. So um, even Ralph could have like, again, stretched and put the cuffs around her, like again, around her neck or someplace where she wouldn't be able to use her hands easily. But I guess for the sake of the episode, we just had to pretend that there wasn't an easy way to take her out. Um, so anyways, that was kind of my part of the episode that I wasn't as happy about. I really do think that that took entirely too long. And one of the things I've never liked about the flash in the past is where they have him kind of get dumbed down or have his powers kind of disappear or him forget how to use certain aspects of it just for the sake of plot. And I don't know. I mean, I guess you got to do what you got to do, but I, I feel like there's a better way of doing these things with him. I mean, 
I think I said a few episodes earlier in the season, you know, Barry has been able to do all kinds of crazy stuff since he came out of the Speed Force. And one of the big things that he's noticed and even the team noticed is that he's faster than he was before he went in. So with that in mind, even if you go back to that bank robbery, again, with Barry not, you know, not accounting for there, there being a safety net of her levitating something uh, in the air that could be harmful. Why? Like when she was like, oh, you can either save the guy in the car or you can or you can let me go. Barry can run faster than the speed of sound and the speed of light and actually the speed of time. So <laughs> you're telling me in that moment that Barry couldn't have taken her, whipped her over to Iron Heights, or well, not, I guess the pipeline, she can't put her around, but like he couldn't have taken her, whipped her over to the pipeline and then ran back and got that guy before he hit the ground. You know what I mean? Or or found a way to handcuff like maybe her hand to her ankle or something like that, which made, made it a lot harder, like behind her back, for example. Like, it just, it drives me nuts because those are moments where they kind of just dumb Barry down or again, they just kind of forget the fact that he's so fast. Barry is so fast. Right? And I mean, anyway, so we'll just, we'll, we'll let it go. I'm just saying, like, that's just my, those are the things that bother me. I feel like that was a moment where Barry could have easily taken care of the villain and taken care of the, the person that was being hurt. But anyways, that's my biggest thing that I thought, some of the biggest things that kind of irked me a little bit, um, it, it's always irked me, not just this, this episode, but throughout the entirety of The Flash, how sometimes we forget that Barry's super fast and super smart. Going on to the stuff with Ralph, I mean, I don't know what to really say about it. Like my whole feeling about it is like, I don't dislike the actor who plays Ralph. I don't particularly dislike Ralph as a character. I just don't, I'm not feeling him in the way that I feel like the show is kind of trying to sell him to me. You know, this whole episode was a giant Ralph pimping episode. And like, I feel like when a character is, whoops, just throwing things around. I feel like when a character is well-written and charismatic and you know the actor does a good job with all that kind of stuff you don't have to sell them to the audience the audience will naturally be drawn and gravitate towards that character that's all there is to it you don't have to sit there and be like hey like this character like this character like this character because i feel like if you have to keep telling your audience that then you should recognize that maybe something's off with this character and it's just like, Ralph, well, first of all, he's all over the place. One week, he's all like, Mr. I don't care about anything. The next week, he's like, no, I want to be a superhero. Then he's back to, I can't do anything because I'm scared. Then he's back to, let's go out there and be gung-ho because I want to face everything. Last week, he was all, or not last week, but the last time we saw him, he was all Mr. Doom and Gloom and you guys aren't getting things done fast enough and blah. And then this week, he can't be serious for two minutes. And it's just like... Can you guys just land somewhere with Ralph, please? Like, and I mean, you guys, I mean, the writers, like, just let's let's level Ralph out a little bit. Have him just kind of find a place and stick with it. Like, the, the comedy part, I don't think is that out there, but this episode, I felt like it was just too heavy. Even I was rolling my eyes along with Barry. Like, there's a time and a place to crack a joke, and there's time and a place to kind of just you know, just hold back a little bit, and I just feel like they were just piling it on a little too heavily just for the sake of having Barry to have a reason to be mad at Ralph. Does that make sense? Like it just, it was too much. And then to turn around and then have to have Iris and you know, other people be like, well, Barry, you're being a little bit rough on Ralph. This is just the way he copes. Yeah, but he's also very annoying and sometimes a little unprofessional. And I think my biggest thing is that Barry had a point. I'm not saying, and I said that in the, in the reaction that Yes, it's true that like everyone copes with stress and, and uh, tragedy and all those things in their own way. So you should never tell someone how they should deal with that. But in this case where Barry and, he, you know, he and Barry are supposed to be working together to do something very strategic and also potentially very dangerous. If you go in with the plan, you stick to the plan. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's not like Barry and Ralph have worked together long enough for Barry to anticipate that Ralph might go off and ad lib and do something on his own. Right? Barry's used to working when he works with Cisco, when he works with Caitlin, when he works with, you know, he works with Wally, it very much was, here's the plan, let's stick to it. And if this plan isn't working, then you both mutually be like, okay, we need to come up with something else. Ralph going off and doing things and cracking jokes and not really paying attention, like it just it's irresponsible and it's not something you can risk with someone as dangerous as DeVoe. So I think that Barry actually had a very valid point. But again, I think the show just kind of twisted it and just didn't make it feel like it came off right. It felt like he was 
crapping on Ralph for being Ralph, and I don't think that was the case. You know, Barry is one of the most forgiving characters on, like, television, period. I don't think he had an issue with Ralph being a jokester. I think he had an issue with the way Ralph was handling himself in what could be potentially very serious and dangerous situations. Anyway, I just felt weird. I felt like, why are we pimping Ralph so much? Like, I just, I wasn't about the cheerleading routine personally, but I guess we're getting stuck with him. <laughs> Um, and I, yeah, I hate to say it like that, but I guess he's going to be a permanent fixture. So this is why the show is really trying to get us to like him. But I feel like they're really going to have to figure out a much more consistent and a little bit improved way of representing his character to really get people to adopt him. Ah, the stuff with Breacher and Siski. Um, that was cute. I like Danny Trejo and I love that his overacting just totally works with this character and that he can get to be his bubbly kind of like corny self because that's your Dre Danny Trejo in real life is really just kind of a really laid back corny kind of guy but because of the way he you know he's got this look and this demeanor about him he's always cast as like a gangster or really like mean evil person so I love that he gets to kind of play a little of both in this that you know he's rough and you know, I'm no teenage girl out of one side of his mouth and the next minute he's like, ooh, donuts. <laughs> Can I have some tea? Um, so it was really well done. I like him and I like that him and Cisco got to do a little bonding here. Although it was kind of weird that we didn't see Cynthia at all in this episode. Uh, I wonder if it was brought in for the sake of saying something about Cisco's powers. That's the only thing I got out of this. I was like, wait, you're telling me at some point Cisco might lose his powers because of age? Um, that saddens me, but again, we don't know that Cisco, I mean, even though Cisco and Breacher and Cynthia's powers are very similar, we don't know if it's going to operate the exact same way, right? Because from, from what I'm understanding, I think that Breacher and Cynthia are potentially born with their powers, whereas we know that with, uh, Cisco, his were a result of, pardon me, the particle accelerator explosion. So maybe Cisco won't be in the same danger of losing his powers eventually, but, uh, that's the only thing I kind of thought about is why would they bring this in? Why would they have this side story unless it was to teach us a little bit more about Cisco's powers? But also, turns out that Breacher has to obviously quit. If he can't actually, <laughs> uh, like, defend himself in the way that he's used to, then he can't really, you know, continue being a, the breach police, I guess. So him offering the job to Cisco is kind of a huge deal, obviously, because he was very proud of his job. Um, do I think he'll take it? Probably not, but I, I don't know. I think it'd be a really great side story for Cisco to temporarily become a breacher, maybe. Like like him just thinking that, you know what, Team Flash maybe doesn't need me 24-7. Let me try doing this breacher thing. I get to spend time with my girlfriend, but I also get to explore and learn how to use my powers a lot better because I don't think Cisco's had as much time to really focus on that. Um, you know, just seeing him play around with it for a while and maybe recognize that maybe it's not something he wants to do for the rest of his life, but we'll see. I mean... Character, character wise, Cisco is one of those ones that really hasn't had a lot of development character wise. Um, you know, Caitlin's even gotten more as far as backstory and, and, and episodes and, and things dedicated to her. And Cisco has pretty much only been comic relief. And that's such a shame because Carlos is such a great actor. And I feel like they just don't even tap into the surface of how good he is. So yeah, this is an opportunity to give Cisco a little ride, a little side adventure that we could explore and, you know, for his character. I would be 100% for that, to be perfectly honest. All right, so now on to the piece de resistance of the episode, the stuff with Marlies and Clifford. Woo! Child. So, I mean, we already picked up since before the Christmas break that Clifford is a twisted SOB and that he had a real dark side, but man, alive. Just when you think this man cannot sink to deeper lows, this show just pulls out one more card to be like, ah, oh, no, actually, we got No, he's worse. He's even worse than that. Like, that stuff with Marlies, this horrible get out, sunken place, mind trippy, edge of tomorrow, crazy stuff. What? I did not see that coming. I did not. Like, I did know that eventually Marlies would probably figure out she was being drugged. But to think 
that part at the end where she records the video message and then she realizes that she's done it before countless times. That blew my, I was like, mic drop, you are the king of evil. Like that, that's, that is the epitome of, oh my God, Clifford. And I said this, you know, I said this very early in the season when we first saw Clifford and Marlies. I said, you know, they, they did when Clifford was still fairly in his own body and still fairly human that they did, I'm sure at one point, have a very beautiful and mature relationship. And like I said, it was very much a parallel. We see Barry and Iris kind of having this relationship together, working together, um, you know, and the same thing with Clifford and Marlies. And then, of course, the difference being, of course, age and then the adversity that they had to go through with Clifford becoming sick. But to think, I said this, I'm like, you know, what? people are super, super intellectual, like the way that Clifford has become, what typically suffers is their humanity, their, their sense of empathy, their sense of caring about other people. And that's exactly what's happened to Clifford. But Marlies is still Marlies for all intents and purposes. And then, of course, as you know, a few when he started drugging her, Clifford already recognized that Marlies was like, mm, I don't think I'm so with this program no more. I don't know if I'm about this anymore. And so he started drugging her with these tears. And like I said, I thought that was the lowest he could go. But my God, my God, to be doing this to her over and over again and using Dominic's power to erase her memories, so just literally just messing with her on such a deep level. Like Marlies will probably never be okay again, you guys. Like even if she does eventually figure out a way to get around this, she's going to be so messed up for the rest of her life. Like it's, it is mind blowingly wrong and creepy and scary. And oh my God, so well done. This is why this villain is next level on The Flash. I don't think I've seen one in a DC show so far on, on the CW that's come close to this level as far as a villain. They've gotten me to the point where I'm on the fence. I mean, part of me feels like Marlies, girl, you signed up for this. <laughs> All right, and you've been party and parlay to your husband killing off how many people for the sake of whatever the heck he wants to do. So I don't feel that badly that you're having your own personal hell. But girl, you talk about karma or things coming around. This is coming around for Marlies to be living in your own personal hell where you can't escape it. Having few moments of clarity of recognizing what your husband is doing to you, but doing be not being able to do a thing about it. And the fact that Clifford left those files, the fact that he left them there for her to find so she could go through this twisted exercise every single time. Like, what a psycho. That is so cruel. Like, that just proves beyond a shadow of a doubt he does not love her at all anymore. Whoever Clifford was before he became the thinker, he is gone. And Marlise is nothing more than just an instrument and a puppet. And as soon as she outlives her usefulness, I have no doubt that he will kill her. Yeah, it, it that was just wow. I don't know what else to say. There's really no other thing to say than wow. That's pretty much the worst nightmare to be literally like mentally and physically trapped with somebody who is using you. And what's worse is for her to like to be on this stuff that makes her think that she's still in love with, oh, it's just so, ugh. It's just, it's stomach turning. And I mean, wow, I mean, kudos to the writers. Like I said, I did not think there was a way that he could slip any further than drugging her and we're there. The only thing that came out of that that I thought was good was that we saw that in this particular rendition of Marlies's Hell, um, he slipped up and said that there were only two metas left to find when there is three, which he basically forgot that he had the weeper and that she didn't know about the weeper. And she was all like, what? Wait, what? Right? Like, I mean, for a man who's supposed to have a damn near perfect brain for him to forget that. I have a theory that his mental capacity is diminishing as a result of all the absorption of the, of the other metas. Like he said in the beginning of the episode that all the dark matter is affecting him and obviously it's wearing through the bodies faster than it did in the beginning. But I also think it's actually having a negative effect on his brain. And he's getting sloppy and making mistakes, but that's good for Team Flash, right? Because that's what's allowing Harry and everybody else to kind of get that kind of leg up and start finding people and finding these metas. So very interesting. That was, like I said, like, I don't even know. My mind is still reeling over the cruelty of that and the craziness of that. And yeah, we'll see. I don't know how Marlise is going to get herself out of it. 
I feel like she's still the key to taking Clifford down, however. Maybe there'll just be a crack that Marlise will manage to find her way through. Yeah, other than that, we just had that little moment with Aunt Harry at the end. I don't know what to make of that. I did say, I think, when we first saw that thinking cap, that there might be some problems Harry using this thing, um, potentially falling into the same trap as, as the thinker, because the reality is Harry and Clifford are very similar in their thirst for knowledge and their arrogance about their intelligence. And with Harry having something that continues to augment his brain, you know, and his desperation to try to get in on par with the thinker, what lengths would he go to? How far would he go? And whatever was going on, I don't think the team knows that he's using Gideon. And how is he using Gideon? Why is he using Gideon? What was he hooking her, you know, his, his cap up to in that room? I've never seen that pedestal before. I have so many questions. I'm just hoping it's not bad. We've already done Bad Harry. Let's not do it again. I really hope the show doesn't go into turning into another villain, but we'll have to see. So what did you guys think of this episode? How do you feel about how Team Flash acted with as far as rounding up this villain? And do you agree with how they kind of pimped Ralph as being this great new addition to the team? And as well, what do you think that Harry is up to? Do you think it's good or bad? And what could he possibly want with Gideon? Please leave your comments below. You know, I love reading them and getting involved in that conversation with you guys. And if you like this video, guys, please click like. And if you want to see more from this geeky face, please click subscribe. Until next time, see ya!